Canon's dual pixel autofocus has been pretty much the industry leading autofocus system for many years now, and it has stayed pretty consistent across their lineup. Sure, there's a few differences here and there between their models, particularly between their cinema cameras and their new mirrorless cameras, but you can pretty much guarantee nowadays that if you buy a Canon camera that isn't one of their more consumer entry level models, it will have fantastic autofocus performance, which you can rely on for professional work. Now, that being said, since the C70 has been released, I've seen a surprising amount of people online criticizing its autofocus and saying that it's not as good as the R5, and even more surprisingly, that it's not even as good as the C200. Now, this really surprised me as I've only seen good things to date from the camera, and we have many, many customers which are using its autofocus all the time for their work very happily. So I wanted to investigate it a little bit for myself, and we're gonna look at the results of all of these tests in detail, but just to summarize here right at the start in case anyone is concerned, from what we can tell from these tests, the C70 is just as reliable as other Canon cinema cameras when it comes to autofocus performance. The mirrorless R5 does outperform it in some areas, mainly because of its smarter software control, eye autofocus, and because it's designed to actually focus in lower light situations in both stills and video. But let's actually look at some tests and show you what we mean. So first up is a simple tracking test and interview setup. This is to test normal situations, if you like, a well-lit interview with a decent lens. First up, we use the RF 24-70mm f2.8, and it tracks perfectly. There's minimal stepping if you watch the bokeh in the background. I can't see any problems here at all, really. As we swap over to the EF version of that lens, you can see it's actually just as good on the C70 here. It's also very smooth and accurate. This is now the C200, a slightly older camera in the cinema lineup, but one that people compare the C72 a lot. And it actually doesn't do quite as well. Don't get me wrong, it's still very good autofocus, but if you watch the bokeh in the background, it's not quite as smooth as the C70, and it moves in a slightly more noticeable way. Next up, we have the R5. The bokeh is larger and more noticeable on this one because of its full frame sensor, but as you can see, the focus moves very smoothly indeed. It's also tracking Dan's eye rather than just his face, which is nice to see. And its performance seems just as good whether you're using the RF or the EF versions of this lens, just like on the C70. So that's face tracking in a well-lit scene. But what about simple objects? And this is where I see the most confusion online. And a lot of it relies on contrast. People can get a bit stuck up on this one because everyone often talks about contrast-based autofocus being the least desirable autofocus system for video. But the reality is that every single autofocus system in cameras does use contrast to some degree in order to work. Let's first start with this shot here. We will pull focus by simply tapping on each object to move the box around the screen. As you can see, the C70 with the RF 24-70 is locking onto each object quickly and easily. No hunting or anything nasty like that. The R5 does the same thing, but here you can really see the more advanced software on the R5 coming into play. As Dan taps on each object, it's intelligently changing the size of the autofocus area to reflect the object. If Dan taps on the figure, it's a tiny little box, but if he taps in the background plant, it's a much larger, taller box. This really helps the R5 focus on the exact thing you mean it to, and I do wish this software comes to the cinema lines at some point. On the C200 performance, it is again very similar, but this is ideal conditions. These subjects have lots of detail in them and the camera can clearly detect contrast to help tell when something's in focus. But let's now try the same test, but with a subject without clear defined contrast, like this armchair in our showroom. As you can see, the C70 just doesn't know what to make of this. It can't tell when it hits focus because there's no contrast there. So it just 
carries on focusing smoothly past it and then back again and back. It just gets very, very confused. If you include the edge of the chair with some stitching on it inside the box, it will use that and find focus easily enough. But then as soon as you move the box back over just the leather chair, it loses focus again. Now before anyone says to themselves that they bet the C200 would have done it, let's take a look. And as you can see, it's the exact same situation. If you include the edge and some stitching, it will find the chair. But if the box is in the middle, it just searches and searches and searches. Now the R5 though is a different story. And it's quite an interesting one. Because its software can tell it's all one object, it grows that box out until it finds the edge. So actually, this sometimes does quite a good job and finds focus without too much trouble, certainly compared to the other ones. If it didn't have this clever AI-based technology though, it would be exactly the same situation as the other cameras. And as you can see, when it doesn't happen to manage to include an edge in its box, it just can't find focus, just like the C70 and the C200. And just for fun, now that we have found something which breaks these Canon cameras autofocus, let's quickly bring in the Sony A7S Mark III just to check it's the same situation with a Sony camera. Now interestingly, the software actually lucks out right at the start of this test and finds the stitching on the edge, and while it's tracking that, it actually keeps focus really well, even when the box is moved. However, as soon as Dan cancels that tracking, it completely loses it and begins to search again. And from that point on, it's a very similar situation to the Canon cameras. And overall, I think the R5 does come off best from this test. Now, another comment that I've seen going around a bit online is that the C70 struggles with darker scenes and darker subjects. Essentially, anything that sits in the lowest, maybe, 30% of your brightness values. So to test this, we lit a very underexposed interview scene. And to be clear, I don't recommend that anyone shoots as dark as this, as you're not gonna get the best out of your camera in any way, shape or form when working like this. If this happens to be the final result which you want, say for a really dark narrative scene, for example, that's absolutely fine, but just expose it a bit brighter and monitor it on set with a lookup table before grading it to look dark like this in post. And then you'll get much better results in pretty much every way. That being said, let's see how the cameras do with this extreme underexposure. First up is the R5, which is the camera which I would expect to do the best here because of its full frame sensor and more powerful software. And as you can see, it starts off very well, spotting Dan's eye and then face, but then loses focus completely all of a sudden. Interestingly, it actually keeps recognizing Dan's face while it's dramatically out of focus. And then after a bit, it does recover as Dan leans forward. I assume because he gets slightly closer to the light source and so his face gets that little bit brighter. And from then on, it does fairly well considering. It does go again, and the movements in the focus are anything but smooth, but all in all, the R5 does fairly well. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said for the C200, though. In our tests, we just couldn't get it to focus at all. In face-only mode, it just wouldn't see Dan's face, and so as he leans forward here, the focus doesn't change. We actually had to check it. We even had it turned on properly, as it just stayed completely still. With face priority, it just used the regular box to focus and it still didn't pick up Dan's face. However, it did actually focus quite well just by reading from that box. So in this situation with the C200, it's probably best to just ignore the face detect modes and just move that box around to track focus. Let's now look at the C70, which after seeing what people have been saying online, I was expecting to behave just like the C200 here. However, it actually does really quite well. It did have one moment where it started focusing all over the place, just like the R5 did. And actually, just like the R5, it kept a box over Dan's face throughout. But it recovers and actually seems to do just as well as the R5 did, which I was quite surprised by. It tracks Dan as he moves, nowhere near as smoothly as it does in decent lighting, but it does do it. So overall, I was actually really impressed by the autofocus performance of the C70. 
Now, I do wish it had some of the more intelligent AI-driven features of the R5, like the eye detect tracking and the focus boxes which change and vary their size to reflect their subject, as that is so useful. I can see why Canon would hesitate to put features like that into their cinema lineup, because keeping some manual control over features like autofocus is always welcome. But as long as they're features which you can turn on and off, I don't really see the harm, as they're great to have in some situations. But the big takeaway here for me is that the autofocus on the C70 performs just as well as any of the other Canon cameras, if not better than models like the C200. You might well ask now, well, how come people online are having such troubles? And the truth is, I'm not quite sure. It could be simply down to the lenses they're using, as lenses do pay a big part in this too, of course, but it's worth remembering that none of these autofocus systems are perfect. There are things which will always trip them up, like we've seen in these tests. The skill as an operator is knowing when to use each autofocus mode and how to get the best results in any one particular situation. So I do hope these tests were useful and if you want to buy any of the products, of course, just head over to prov.co.uk. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.